Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have questions. Why are so many Americans refusing to go back to their old jobs? And is this creating a labor crisis? Let's get to the bottom line. Of all the side effects of the coronavirus pandemic, this may be the one that affects the economy most. Millions of American workers are staying away from the service jobs that actually make America run. That's retail stores and restaurants, truck drivers, you name it, across the board. Businesses say they're desperately looking for new employees, and there are millions and millions of job openings, but folks just aren't interested. In some places, you can get $50. That's a lot just for showing up for a job interview. In others, you get a $1,000 signing bonus. Fast food and gas stations are offering double the national minimum wage in some places, but there still aren't enough takers. Economists say this is really slowing down America's economic recovery from the pandemic, and it's driving up inflation, meaning the cost of everything is going up. But why? Are people reassessing their lives after the global pandemic and deciding that staying at home with their family or just retiring is more important than their old job? Or are they happier to stay at home and receive an unemployment check rather than work, as many Republican governors are saying? Today, we're talking to Melissa Swift, the global leader for workforce transformation at the management consultant firm Corn Ferry, and Jeremy Robbins, the executive director of the research and lobbying group New American Economy. Thanks to both of you for joining us today. Let me just start out and ask Melissa. Right now, we have this picture. It's very interesting. After talking for so long about those workers who were displaced during this pandemic, we're, we're now getting to the other side of this, and we're seeing a lot of folks not lining up to take those jobs back. Is that because they're feeling a change in work life and work quality, life quality is needed, or is it a function of, you know, they've been receiving a lot of bailout money um, and they, they're, making, they're doing better, you know, not working than working? Well, it's always going to be a balance, right? It's going to be, how am I rewarded for doing this job versus what's in this job? Right. So it's very easy to look at the kind of how am I rewarded? Right. So that's the unemployment benefits. That's do we need to pay folks more, et cetera, et cetera. But the more interesting side is what's in this job. And I think through the pandemic, what's in different jobs has changed. So as a, for instance, if I'm a restaurant worker and I now feel like I might, you know, I'm in a jurisdiction where not a lot of people are vaccinated. Right. I feel like I might still get exposed. That uh, that calculus changes how I feel about my job. Similarly, if I'm a retail worker, I'm having to argue with people about wearing masks. That's emotional labor. And in some cases, folks have been physically endangered. And that changes how I think about my job again. So that those scales where you balance what's in my job versus what I get paid for it really do change. And then there's some of the intangibles. You know, if I'm going into a workplace where there are fewer people right, and I'm not getting that camaraderie, that sits on one side of the scales, too. And I think that's what's interesting, is it's easy to kind of look at the compensation aspect, but the job side is kind of where the action is. I think one of the other uh, questions, Jeremy, and I've been thinking about a long time, that we've come out of four years of a presidential administration, and I think I'm probably um, understating uh, their ambivalence about immigration into this country. But as we have looked at a lot of the jobs that, that are not being filled. Oftentimes, there's a mix of, you know, young people, college students, but we also have a lot of immigrants who want to come to this country, and these are a lot of the jobs that they do, you know, on farms and in, you know, labor and, and in restaurants and service jobs. And so I, I, I'd love to get a sense of whether or not, the, you know, we, we've walked into something that the pandemic began to show, guess what? We really need immigrants. Yeah, that's a great point, Steve. I mean, I think one thing that became very clear in the pandemic was this idea of the essential worker and who were the people that were fundamentally important to getting our economy to work and to keeping us safe and to keeping food on our plates and keeping goods moving. And, and long before the pandemic, we knew we had a skills mismatch, right? There have been, if you look at survey after survey from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are always five, six million jobs that we can't fill because the skills that we need are different than the skills that Americans have. Uh, in the latest survey, it's over 9 million jobs, 9.3 million jobs as of April. That's up a million over the month before, because we simply don't have the skills we need where they are. Um, the one thing that America has that's going to make us rebound from this pandemic better than just about any other country, though, is that we have really robust immigration. We have people who are coming here to work with a different set of skills, who are more mobile, who are more willing to work. Uh, tough jobs when they first get here, partly by necessity, partly by the fact that we're selecting for people who want to work. Um, and, and that's a huge benefit. 
But as you said, over the last four years, when there's been a real crackdown on immigration, um, some of that has slowed. So at the same time that Americans are becoming less mobile, this great competitive advantage that we have of having people come in and work and regenerate the economy has slowed in a really dramatic fashion. Well, we have right now, and tell our audience, over 9 million unfilled jobs. This is a record high in the United States. Uh, as you look at, I also know, I mean, I know people on all sides of this equation. I know a lot of people who say, you know, we've now gone digital. They have a very different kind of social contract they want with their employers. They may not have been able through, you know, the absence of child care or, you know, schools being shut down to sort of manage that home life. But they love their time with their children. Some do. Uh, and, and, and others are kind of looking at that whole question of how can they negotiate a new deal? Do you think we're going to see a lot more of new deal negotiating, Melissa? Absolutely. I mean, we are certainly when you get a dramatic labor shortage, right, that really empowers the individual worker. And I think we're going to see some interesting push-pull over what work should look like going forward. The reality is that the kind of traditional office construct didn't serve everybody well, right? It served a certain subset of the population pretty well. But if you're, let's say, a working mother who has to, you know, sneak out early, right, to take care of your kids, if you're the only person of color in your office mm -hmm. and you don't feel included, there's a whole kind of bunch of ways that the traditional construct just wasn't working. And so now, with some actual kind of power on the worker side, because of these shortages, I think we're definitely going to see a renegotiation. I think what's interesting is that the rhetoric at CEO level is so different than what you see in survey after survey at worker level. And I'm fascinated to see how that plays out, to be honest. If you were to give advice to an employer, I, I have a friend who has about 90 employees here in Washington, D.C., and, and she was saying she's beginning to talk to her people about coming back to the office and working, but what they really want, and she kind of, you know, sarcastically smiled. She said, you know, they want to have Mondays and Fridays at home, which, of course, you know, makes nice four-day weekends if you're going to. So I guess what, if you were to advise a, uh, 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 an employer, would you, would you push them to say, hey, give them Tuesdays and Wednesdays or Wednesdays and Thursdays as opposed to trying to work time into uh, free time? It's certainly what we're seeing. I mean, what, where we're seeing, there's a fulcrum point around two to three days a week in the office, and generally those days are not Monday and Friday. Mm. But, you know, I think that the bigger picture is also the flexibility and understanding who really needs to be in the office, right? Does your work demand that you be in the office? And looking at some of the interdependencies, you know, okay, I say my group has to be in, but this other group that we work with all the time, they're not in, right? So does my group have to be in? And, and really pressing on the work, not just kind of trying to snap back to the prior reality, which we're not living in anymore. The one, the one thing I'd add to that quickly is just to, we need to experiment. I mean, I think one mm -hmm. thing we're learning even in our own organization uh, is that there are huge benefits to working at home. I mean, I, I'm doing this from my children's playroom right now, right? And I have those extra commuting hours to, to do more work, get more things done, and, and, and take care of life. Um, but there are also huge things we lose, right? Where how do we have the, the office cooler conversation where ideas are generating. If you're not going out for lunch, when your team is seeing each other only in meetings and not in these other organic conversations. And I think it's what we're struggling with and the businesses we work are struggling with is how do you do both? How do you have a balance um, that, that doesn't assume that when people are working from home, they're not being productive? Because in a lot of ways, I think what this year has shown is that people can be more productive working from home in some ways. But how do you also facilitate all the things that happens when you bring people together? And I think that's one of the Certainly in the, in the idea generative and sort of the innovation economy, uh, that's where so much of the, of the sauce happens. Jeremy, th thank you for that. You know, one of the other things I've been trying to think about is the mathematics of this. So about two and a half million jobs in America in the restaurant sector wiped out, gone. You know, who knows if they'll come back, but, but right now they're gone. Another two and a half million people have chosen to retire, take retirement benefits, benefits and move on and, you know, travel, hang out with their grandchildren, you know, do all other things. And I think, you know, when you kind of begin looking at it, it was interesting that we just had a debate recently about what the national minimum wage should be. And that national minimum wage today is $7.25. The debate was whether we take it up to $15 or $11. Well, I've been driving across a lot of Western states that have been very opposed to raising the minimum wage. Uh, and guess what? Dunkin' Donuts, $15 an hour offered. Sheets Auto uh, uh, auto centers and gas stations and convenience stores, 
$15.50 an hour. These are big numbers to people who previously were working at fast food joints for $7.25 an hour. So is, is that debate about the minimum wage now moot? Is it silly, uh, given the fact that the, that the market price is, is now double that? It's a great question. I mean, I, th I think certainly people are going to show that, that you can pay a higher wage and, and still run businesses, but you're going to see some businesses that will struggle with that. I think one of the really interesting debates when you look at those jobs is not even those jobs themselves, but the broader jobs within those industries. When you look at the, you mentioned 9 million jobs open in April. Well, when you look at the jobs where the fastest increase in those jobs in that, in that uh, Journal of uh, Labor Statistics report, the biggest growth was in accommodation, restaurants, hospitality, sort of the industries that had been the hardest hit, but that are now coming back. Um, and especially when you look at the, in, within those industries, there's some really good college educated jobs too, but those aren't gonna exist if you can't fill uh, the really hard jobs, the night and weekend jobs, the cleaning jobs, the, the, front of, the front of store jobs. And so those are ones where I think certainly you're gonna see sort of a rejiggering of like, what do we have to pay? What do we have to do to get workers? How do we have to change the jobs and, and restructure them in a way that works for all workers? Let me ask yeah, you and both. To just oh, jump go ahead, go ahead, Melissa. No, I was gonna say just to jump in on that point, which I think is a fantastic one. Uh, this idea that jobs are changing and work is changing. I think this was happening under the surface for a while. And what we got out of COVID was an acceleration mm. that people really do want their work to be structured differently. And now that we have the opportunity to do it, right, let's let's keep going with it. And what? that there is a belief that people want to do good jobs. And at the same time, you also had a large population that was kind of pent up to retire, but working longer and longer. And you're getting that population saying, OK, I am going to pull the trigger on retirement, thus pulling what was kind of artificially inflated supply of talent out of the market. And so really part of what happened was just there were a bunch of things that were kind of creeping up on happening, and then they happened all at once. Well, let me, let me just talk to you both. We'll let, Melissa, you first, and then we'll just have, but I find it very ironic at some level. Both of you are thinking about workforce transformation, about what it takes uh, in a new economy. And I have to tell you, before COVID hit, before we made this big jump from really what was still an analog world to a digital world, we were talking about digital skills. We were talking about the coming disruptive technologies that were going to you know, transform work, transform the workplace. And a lot of people were going to be put out of work if they didn't keep up with that level of skills, that we were going to have automated trucks, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, and, you know, we would see this Uber driver force and truck force. But if you go out right now, truck drivers get such a premium in getting trained and out there. It is a, it is a great time if you're a truck driver. But I'm just sort of interested, are we in a, in a kind of a moment, uh, uh, an oasis for a certain kind of low-skilled job that all of a sudden we need? And will these other digital transformation issues come back? Because that's what I find interesting is we're, we're not talking about those high-end, high-skilled jobs. We're talking about regular folks that may be not educated and, and up to the data in terms of, you know, digital skill sets. Melissa? Well, I think part of what's interesting is that we've thought about those jobs in terms of binaries, right? That one day there's a human driving a truck and then the next day, right, there's a truck driving a truck. And what's actually happened is the pace of automation has kind of crept up. So the sort of computerized component of being a truck driver is much greater than it used to be, right? It's a, it's a continuum, not kind of a fall off a cliff. And I think that's part of what's interesting. You know, working in a, in a Starbucks, right? There are far more automated computerized components than there used to be, but that barista job isn't gone yet. And I think that's the, the trend that we're going to see. And the interesting thing about a lot of these jobs that we've gotten very fixated on, like, let's say, you know, building software, right? A lot of software building is going to get automated in the next decade. And what we think of as those great jobs that folks are supposed to go into, those jobs are actually going to go away. So I, I think it's kind of interesting to then think about, okay, automation comes in, human jobs change, but then other humans can kind of come in. I think what we see when jobs get automated is that it also creates space for kind of more emotional labor, empathic labor, you know, the pieces that only humans can do. And I think it'll be very interesting to see what jobs get created in that part of the economy. Jeremy, say what you like, but I want to know, yeah. are we going to have a future where we can have emotional and empathic robots? I, I'm sure we will. I mean, I think we can't even imagine what's coming. And I think that's sort of the point I wanted to make, because I think Melissa's point is fabulous. But 
we're really bad at predicting what's going to happen with automation, right? We've had automation uh, for 30 years has been accelerating in a real way. And it's like, oh, it's going to take this job. And it is. I mean, there are 8 million truck drivers who are going to, there are going to be self-driving trucks and, and all the workers in, uh, you think about Amazon factory and the hundreds of thousands or millions of people that are being employed there, that will be robotic and those people, those jobs will be replaced. But, but what will come next, right? I mean, before the recession, we were at 4% unemployment after 30 years of automation. And so you think about the question is not so much, I think it is, where will there be enough jobs, but will they be good jobs? And for people, especially people who are not going to be, who, who don't have the, the education level or, or ability to be part of the, the creative economy, which I think is going to reap a lot of the spoils of this automation, for the jobs that exist, especially the service level jobs, which there will be many of, are they going to be jobs that you can make a living wage? Are they going to be jobs that are safe and that you can support your family? And so I think those are going to be the questions uh, that are going to dominate far more than will there be jobs at all. You know, I, I thank you for that. I want to just, you know, be very careful here about one thing, because I think we've been focusing on on, on those who haven't gone back. I mean, there are more than 10 million people who have gone back to work, who have, you know, taken up this load and they're back, you know, in these service jobs and doing things. So, so we see that. So we're running a deficit. But also those people in deficit, I, I, I just want to give them a chance to, you know, to, to be thought about for a moment because, you know, I was reading yesterday um, about a family um, who at home, they're, they both have elder care. Um, this lady also has a son um, with, with, uh, who is in remission from cancer. And so there's still a fear out there uh, as we see variants uh, circling around in, in, you know, from COVID in the United States. And this whole question about the fragility of health, the fragility of life. I just want to tell our audience that's also a legitimate part of this question. Is it not, Melissa? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think probably one of the most positive things to come out of COVID is a, a different way of thinking about kind of what health and safety on the job mm. means. Right. You know, it's not just I'm not going to fall off a ladder and break my neck. Right. There's a much broader definition and it extends to things like exposure to disease. It extends to things like burnout. You know, we've seen some really interesting data recently from the World Health Organization about burnout literally killing people uh, very, very timely after, you know, what a lot of people's you know, work life balance looked like during COVID. Uh, and I think we're going to think about those themes more expansively and and in more depth. And, you know, what does it mean to be a frontline worker constantly exposed to, you know, sort of negative emotional impacts in your job or things like that? Jeremy, when you kind of look at this question of people where they are and meeting them where they are, as we think about the new American economy, I guess another dimension, I mean, you know, I'm trying to kind of get my head around what does the modern worker social contract look like? You know, is it going back down, in my case, in Washington, D.C., on K Street, where we have lots of new buildings, and I don't think they're going to be that full for a while. You know, how do we kind of bring together something that's fair to all sides and also nimble? And I guess part of the question I have for you, when you think about the new American economy, we also had a lot of gig workers. We had workers that were not going back for full-time work, and they were, you know, and we, all, we also have, I'll just mention, there's a fascinating uh, study called the Venture Forward Study, which GoDaddy and the University of Iowa, UCLA, Anderson School of Business, and Arizona State did, that looks, there's been an explosion of micro-businesses online of people kind of doing their own thing. And I kind of applaud all that. I sort of think, it, wow, that's a sign of health and breaking away from the traditional, you know, long-term service at one company. Do you have any insights into how that evolution is going and what sped up and, and what you're worried about in that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I, mean, I think, look, disruption is messy. But ultimately, if you look at the history of America and our economy, it's been very good, right? Moments where you had to have something new happen. I mean, one of the things we're studying now uh, is we're looking at the last recession to try and understand who were, what were the cities that fared well and what were the cities that struggled? And what, what made them, uh, set them apart? And one of the things we're seeing, because uh, we look at immigration, is that the cities that were more welcoming towards immigrants were actually the hardest hit in the last recession after 2008, because they had more of those people that were bringing in new ideas, new businesses on the front lines. And those were some of the most vulnerable, but also the most responsible for growth. And so when they, just like in this pandemic, when the people who are losing their jobs were the restaurant workers and, uh, and the small entrepreneurs and people who didn't have the capital to stay going, um, that's what happened there. But then when you looked at the recovery, the cities that recovered the fastest and ultimately were doing the best were the ones that were investing in bringing in new people and new ideas and people from, and they were more dynamic, they were more responsive. 
because they had people with different networks, different capabilities, different interests, and they were starting new businesses. I live in New York, and if you look at New York, what happened, and there were closed businesses all throughout 2008, just as there are now. But the neighborhoods that responded the fastest were Bay Ridge in Brooklyn and Jackson Heights in Queens, where you'd have largely immigrants, but, but people of all nations coming in, starting new mom and pop shops, new Main Street businesses. Um, and so I think that's one recipe is that we have to say, look, there are going to be people who are going to be displaced, and we need to invest really heavily in them. It can't just be about what are the jobs of tomorrow. We should also be investing in creating jobs for the skills we have today. But we can't lose sight of the fact that it is going to be a new economy, and we do want to experiment, and we do want to invest in entrepreneurs, and we do want to invest in, in trying to, to upskill people and, and make sure that they have jobs that work for them. Melissa, you were nodding. You, you want to comment? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, everything you're saying really resonates. I mean, I think of this as if you look at graphs of who was in what sector of the economy around 1900, right, you see the agrarian graph coming down pretty dramatically and services and manufacturing coming up, you know, pretty dramatically. And they're kind of crossing at one point. I think we're at another point like that, to be honest, where, you know, again, mm -hmm. COVID speeded it up, but there right. is just a lot of transition between sectors of the economy. And, and to the point that was just made, the whole economy isn't, it's not all sort of industrial, right. right? There are artisanal parts of the economy. And during those transition moments, those parts can be really vibrant and we shouldn't discount the impact or, you know, kind of not look at how we care for that part of the economy as right. well. We have about a minute left, so really quickly, I'm going to get some free consulting advice from both of you, Cornface, so, so don't charge, don't send me a bill. But real quick, the Federal Reserve of San Francisco has said that one in seven Americans, that $300 a week extra unemployment uh, 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 insurance that they get would not stop them from going to get a job. So it's a small portion for which that matters, according to the survey. 26 Republican governors have squeezed off those benefits. Another set of governors are keeping them in place until September. Do you think that those checks make a difference right now in the calculus? Is the worker not going back because that worker is just, I'm having a good time getting unemployment checks? Um, just real quick, Melissa and, and Jeremy. I'll give Jeremy the last word. Yeah, I don't, I don't think those checks are making a major difference. I think, again, there are a lot of other needs that work fills for people. And so if people are not coming back, it's right. because there's not the right work, not because that $300 on the margin makes a right. difference. And I think it's important to keep that in place to support the folks that really are still teetering a bit. Jeremy, I'm going to give you a real fast, quick word, last word. Yeah, I don't have the expertise to, to disagree or agree, but I will say, unfortunately, we're going to get a real experiment where you're going to see, and it's going to, at the cost of a lot of pain for people, you're going to see how people are faring. But I certainly think at this moment, we need to invest in workers and we need to invest in making sure that people are able to, to stay afloat. Loved this conversation. Really appreciate Melissa Swift, Workforce Transformation Consultant at Corn Ferry, and Jeremy Robbins, Executive Director of New American Economy. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So what's the bottom line? The biggest lesson that we've all learned from the pandemic is that life is really short and it can be fragile. Is it any wonder that folks are rethinking their lives and their options nowadays? Well, I don't think so. This was happening even before the pandemic and was one of the major drivers of immigration, both legal and illegal, into the United States. Folks at the border were trying to get into America. Well, they want those jobs, and a lot of the folks already here, well, they don't want those jobs. So for workers in low-paying jobs like retail and fast food, or even in some higher-paying jobs like teachers and office workers, many people just burn out during the pandemic. And now they're looking for something different. So don't be surprised if soon you drop by a department store or a fast food window and a robot says, here's your order. The algorithms are coming, and that's the bottom line.